said you have seen the exam results, which are quite satisfactory for me. I don't, I don't know how you think about it, but uh, the grades seem to be well all right. Yeah? Acceptable at least. Means that there was no surprises in the exam. Around something 70, something closing, coming close to the 70, at the mean height. So that the majority would not have any difficulties in passing the class. Okay, today, what are we going to do today? Altusar. Oh, Altusar. Okay, wow, this one. That guy. That guy uh, was a quite strange man, actually, but it represents a lot. I can say that in the last turn of the Western thinking, perhaps Louis Althusser was the man who played the most important and most crucial role. Okay. Even though I would say that uh, his ideas, his thoughts, as I'll try to present them, uh, uh, and you will see, uh, were rather confused, so to speak. Okay? Uh, one foot standing in the classical theory, the other foot trying to step onto the uh, what we call later on post-structuralism and postmodern theory and so on. But his role was crucial simply because yeah, he active in writing. That was the period he was most influential, at, especially during the second part of the 60s. Okay? His most influential books actually <laughs> Reading Capital and Four Max, both published in 1965. The first one in English translation with Etienne Balibar. Some texts including Etienne Balibar. Actually, this one, that book was the result of a workshop that Althusser organized with his students. Uh, reading Marx books, Marx book, not books. The Capital, Das Kapital. Okay. Uh, it was a very close and true reading of the book and driven some important consequences. I don't think important in the sense of the later development of Marxist thinking, but important in, for the development of postmodern thinking. Okay? We should not forget that he was true and true Marxist and a member of the French Communist Party uh, and a believer, true believer in Marxism actually. Uh, perhaps fought until the end. I'm not sure till the end. Yeah, and in the book he published in 1980 or 82, I don't remember the exact date, mm, entitled The Underground Current of Materialism, okay, where he presents his version of materialism and finally concludes that he diverts from Marxism. He would not try any longer to, uh, to reinterpret Marxism, okay? So in these earlier efforts, however, uh, he tries to reinterpret Marxism in a rather different way, actually different and against the established current of Marxist interpretations, the orthodox Marxist interpretations. You know, up until then, Marxism was primarily understood as a sort of Hegelianism upside down uh, with it is humanism and and then what? Uh, mm, I forgot. <laughs> mm, mm, okay, with humanism. Okay, let's continue where we have left. Anti-humanism and anti-humanist attitude, as well as yeah, historicism. I mean. Okay, we have emphasized. I have emphasized how important that idea of history developed by Hegel. Okay, it was finally a well-developed conceptualization of history, but enabling everybody else, including Marx, okay, to begin to see the events in, in the sequential consecutive temporality of history. Okay? So the society is coming and passing one after another. Uh, each society or each mode of organization, or in Marxist terms, each mode of production giving way to another and more developed mode of production and so forth. 
and each and with each and every step humanity approaching to something more something higher at least okay? if not something more complex more developed we can say at least okay? forms of social organization and so on okay? but strangely enough Althusser in his struggle within the French Communist Party as well raised the flag of anti-humanism and uh, anti-historicism okay? that was strange uh, simply because he adapted the dialectical method first developed by Hegel and later on adapted by Karl Marx but how, how do you reconcile this uh, actually? Okay. The uh, idea of anti-humanistic Marxism anti-historicist Marxism how do you think about it? Is it possible for you? Therefore, he blamed of being a structuralist within Marxism, which was considered in those times as something contrary to the basic premises of Marxism. Yeah, they were right indeed, actually. Later developments had proved, at least they were right, that this was a sort of uh, the declaration of end of Marxism, actually, culminated in the declaration of Marxism end of Marxism, but Althusser was not intended to do so, therefore I can say that he was quite confused, theoretically speaking, on the one hand trying to defend Marxism, on the other hand bringing new interpretations inspired by structuralism and especially Lacanian psychoanalysis, okay, that was interesting. Um, the other things I like to share with you is uh, well, first let's dwell on the issue of uh, anti-humanism in Marxism. Okay? As everybody knows, I, ah, before that let me point out one significant uh, fact actually with regard to his importance in this last twist of Western thinking. You know, in those times, 1960s, 50s, etc., the European West was dominated, or intellectual life of the European West was dominated by the leftist influences. Okay? If you are going to call somebody as intellectual, you could be sure in those times that that somebody would uh, have some connections with leftist movements in Europe. Okay? There were no proeminent rightist theoreticians, if you do not count those Americans, Talcott Parsons, Robert Merton, etc., etc. Okay, so they were not taken seriously in European social sciences, uh, except Turkey. Okay, uh, even though they had an influence to exercise, but there was in those times a separation as well between uh, leftist modes of thinking, modes I call, okay, modes of thinking, and uh, mainstream, so-called mainstream sociology, okay? Mainstream sociology from the early years on of the 20th century began to be interpreted as a kind of bourgeois science, you know? Bourgeois science and uh, discussed by the leftist circles, okay? But strangely enough, it was the leftist who dominate the intellectual scene, engaging in lively discussions and so on and so forth. And that was why Althusser was important indeed, simply because he was somebody coming from the leftist roots but declaring a flag against the, what he called the orthodox interpretation of Marxism. Okay? Therefore, enabling the European intelligentsia gradually, his impact, his effect actually, uh, to think outside the Marxist worldview, okay? Gradually they began to think, they be, began to acquire the ability to think, if you like, outside of Marxist frameworks. Okay? So that since then on, uh, the postmodern thinking would have the chance to flourish in European environments. Okay? So that was very important indeed. First of all, let's take, as I said, the issue of anti-humanism, or as he, call, as he called sometimes, for instance, the problem of the subject in history. 
Now we have seen that there are many references, as Althusser himself confesses, to the real man, concrete man, living man, man making history, even though under certain, certain circumstances, etc., etc. And talk about lots of talk reference about the nature of man, even communist manifesto or the purpose, the aim of establishing communism uh, was legitimized or just justified that it was for the sake of man, for the sake of overcoming the alienation of man, which history brought about onto the fate of man and so on. Okay, you know, in communist society we are going to all be happy uh, living ever after, etc., without uh, no requirement of enforced labor. We, we are going to work only to uh, realize what we ourselves are, and so on. Okay. Actually, even this purpose, this aim of humanity is realizing what it itself is, okay, uh, points out the value of the human in Marxist thinking. Okay. So, how come this anti-humanism. Uh, upon what grounds Althusser hoped to succeed to establish this claim of his against the mainstream so-called orthodox Marxist interpretations? Okay. Well, for this purpose, he engaged in this uh, reading capital actually. It was a workshop with his students. Uh, for this purpose, he adopts a certain uh, mode of reading. Okay? He calls actually this mode of reading, he derives from psychoanalysis, he studies in psychoanalysis, and he calls it as this symptomatic reading. Okay? Symptomatic reading. So uh, it is not an immediate reading, it is not a reading which sees it as a task for itself to remain loyal word by word to the text, okay? But rather tries to see through what the text makes visible as well as invisible, okay? What is hidden in the text remaining invisible, etc. Okay? okay, you can open uh, the legitimacy of uh, such a method of reading to discussion, well, all right, but this was how Althusser preferred to read the Marxist texts, okay? Actually, in those times, they were engaged in a quite close reading of Marxist texts, and almost sentence by sentence and word by word, they are going through these texts, okay? And Althusser find out that, I don't know, even today, in those times, I was thinking that he was right, but I'm not sure any longer, okay? Find out that it would be possible to uh, at least uh, differentiate four different, three different initially, later on four different states, theoretical states, so to speak, in Marx's thinking, okay? So, on the one hand, those early writings, apart in 1948, uh, philosophical and economic manuscripts, and later on, uh, the other writings in between, German ideology, etc. And uh, finally, uh, starting with the early 1850s, capital, a series of capital, their prefaces added later on, etc. And uh, contribution to the critique of economic politics, etc. Such later texts, okay. And he claimed that in these early periods up until 1948, 1848, I'm sorry, Marx was quite under the influence of Hegelian thinking. Actually, he could be considered as a sort of young Hegelian, one of the members of that uh, curious group of thinkers. Okay? Uh, the later period, which was interpreted by Althusser as a period of, so to speak, transition, uh, <coughs> and the final period where finally Marx did find what is nature and developed, succeeded in developing his true Marxist theory, okay? especially in Capital and the other volumes of Capital, including uh, the contribution 
as well as uh, the forewords and afterwards written at about the end of the 1850s, 1857 or so, gotta read the dates, okay. Well, did he find there was this, okay. When he said the earlier text was under the influence of Hegelian thinking, his major point was that Hegelian notion of subjective, you know, Marx says that he just uh, turned the Hegelian idealism upside down, adapting the method <laughs> methods uh, that Hegel developed in his phenomenology and in his analysis, especially logic, okay? So this is called dialectics. And we have talked about what dialectics was in a Hegelian sense. For Kant, for instance, a dialectic was impossible. Okay? Who thought, oh, in a certain sense, in a definite sense, the imminence of consciousness, that it is in being imprisoned in its own self, a dialectic was Im impossible. So dialectic here, in that sense, implied a certain relationship between mediated or direct, okay, between the inside and outside of the consciousness, okay, or if you like, between me and the world, or things, whatever, okay. So uh, it was Hegel that succeeded in establishing a possibility of dialectic, but uh, with the cost of encapsulating the totality of existence inside thinking, which he called spirit. So everything is taking place inside thinking. It is thinking which separates, or spirit, which separates itself as me, internal me, and external world, etc. Okay? I'm not going to repeat all these discussions, but therefore, within the totality of the spirit, there turns out to be possible to engage in a dialectical relationship between the me, internal me, and external world. Simply because both are internal, <coughs> being internal to the spirit. Okay. So the Kantian framework had been enlarged, as you can see, and another me has been embedded into it as to separate it, actually Kantian transcendental subject, as to be separated from the phenomena, rest of the phenomena, if you like, okay? So between this subject and the rest of the phenomena, there seems to be established a dialectical relationship possible. So it is this dialectic enforces separate to evolve, to sublate itself, to overcome its own current prevalent contradictions and develop into higher forms and so Okay, Marx saying that re while rejecting Hegelian idealism but adapting the method of dialectic, therefore, you know, Marxist theory is also called dialectic materialism, okay. So idealism has been replaced by materialism. So that's what Hegel called as spirit turns out to be the history in Marxist sense. Okay? No longer the history of idea, no longer history of spirit, but the history of the human societies. Okay? Human societies consisted of living, actual, real men. Okay? So however, between these living men and the world, there remains this dialectic relationship continuously. Okay? As you know, Marx's first dialectical contradiction is uh, the contradiction between <coughs> man and nature. Man and nature. Okay? Then later on, man develops into society, and then contradiction carries itself over to the society, into the society, and we begin to talk about the classes, emergence of social classes, which are antagonistically related with each other. Okay? And uh, the, uh, the form of classes that they take you know, under capitalist mode of production or capitalist relations of production are, you know, as you know, the couple bourgeoisie and proletariat.
However, the problem of subject remains here. So we have not touched about it. So, okay, touched upon. It. The problem of the subject, you, as you may remember, it was in Hegel's spread. Subject in the sense of the subject of history, okay? So, history, all the whole temporality of time, is nothing else than the temporality of the transformations, which is undergone by the spread, okay? Nothing else. However, when we turn this upside down, what we get is man and his society and the environment to which we refer as nature. Okay? Or if you like, in Marxist terminology, material existence. Okay? No longer the spirit, but material existence. And in this material existence, the carrier of history cannot be nature, simply because it was taught something uh, ahistorical, if you like, okay? Therefore, this task has been attributed to man, okay? It was man who made history, you know, their own history. It was men who make their own histories, even though under certain conditions, but the parameter here turns out to be men. So men constitute society, men engage in social relationships, men engage in the activity of labor and production, men engage in the or task of organizing the process of production, men engage in the cluster. Okay. And the class struggle, as you know, was conceived as the motor of history. And since this history aims at, actually has no aim other than the realization of man's nature, okay, For an orthodox Marxist, it was just natural to accept the idea that Marxism is indeed a sort of humanism. Okay? It invites the workers. You know, you remember, for instance, uh, Lukacin's interpretation of the task and destiny of the working class or proletariat. Okay? It was only that class, proletariat, capable of knowing, coming to the knowledge of the truth of the concrete totality of the society. Ah, okay. Therefore, this knowledge endows the working class with the task of uh, emancipating the society okay, from capitalist exploitation. While at the same time, actually this task involving an annihilation of both of the classes, bourgeoisie and proletariat. Okay. So, proletarian struggles on the one hand, but it struggles for its own destruction at the same time. Okay, for what? Okay, to emancipate mankind from alienation. And actually, you can find lots of references to this problem, as Althusser did said, especially in those early works of Karl Marx. Okay. But Althusser claimed that actually the real materialism is neither, uh, or dialectical materialism, is neither historicist, not historical. I am not saying historical. Materialism itself is historical, but not historicist, okay? I'm going to point out what the difference is later on, okay? And then, uh, at the same time, is not anti-humanist, anti okay? Is anti-humanist or not humanist. To be able to say this uh, and raise this claim, Althusser in this reading capital directs his critical gaze onto the problem of the subject of the history. Okay. When I say this, you are going to perhaps surprised. Okay, I don't know. How do you think about history? I don't know. Okay. Simply because this argument, this justification of the claim of anti-humanism, uh, locating itself on the question of the subject, 
turn out to be later on quite important for our understanding of the history. Okay. Simply because Althusser directing his criticisms to the effect that history cannot have a subject. Okay. Actually, his claim was that history should be thought without subjects and a goal. Simply because when you insert the idea of the subject as the backbone, or as the main actor of historical transformation, you would necessarily impose the idea of the telos of the history. That was exactly the Hegelian notion of history. You know, history got to start from some certain definite point and got to direct the whole development to some definite, pre-given, definite, contained in the beginning, okay, uh, endpoints. And Marxist terminology had adopted this view, unfortunately, okay? Yeah, and we are going to start with primitive societies where man faces or uh, immediately experiences that contradiction between man and nature and develop further into society, okay, pushing aside. Uh, this originary contradiction for a moment and engaging in social contradictions, antagonistically post through antagonistically post classes, passing through all of these contradictions, passing through different societies, and finally arriving at a certain end, the realization of the nature of man. Okay? Overcoming the alienation. This implies that history should be thought, just like in the Hegelian case, in rather progressive terms. Okay? Simply because this is the history of a development, which means that one stage coming prior to another stage, which comes later on, okay, that earlier stage is more primitive, or if you like, less developed. For example, feudal society is a less developed society in comparison to the capitalist society. Or capitalist society is a less developed society in comparison to the socialist and communist societies. So, and so, so we have an aim, an idea of progress. We're still, not only that, one definite single point of a start of history and a single point of its end for itself. Okay? Actually, this is quite popular for a time. Uh, uh, in sociology, for instance, I can say at least up until 70s, perhaps even 80s, it was quite popular. But increasingly, it turned out to be impossible to defend such a weak point. Okay? Simply because such a weak point um, Nowadays, begins begin to be began to be interpreted as rather totalizing. You know, if that country over there is evaluated as more developed than this country, this society, for instance, then the task of this society is to try to imitate the other society, okay, which are which was considered as more advanced, and so on, okay. Uh, just like in the Hegelian case. Another important point is that this history was conceived as a continuity, an unceasing, never interrupted continuity. Okay? There were points of interruption, perhaps, but within the continuity of history, they were considered as the periods of transition. Example, the problems of the question of transition from feudalism to capitalism, okay? or from capitalism to socialism, okay? etc. Okay? Periods of transition. So, you know, as Marx did say, capitalist society emerges out of the bosom of the feudal society, okay? implying that continuity. So, implying that. The capitalist relations of production had began to be generated, developed within the bosom, inside the feudal uh, relations of production. Okay? So this idea implying a certain continuity. Here, 
As we have seen, Althusser's periodization of Marxist theorizing and parallel to this, actually what Althusser tried to introduce here was a very important idea. The idea of break. Okay. The idea of break proved to be very important simply because with this idea, after the development of this idea, it began increasingly difficult to see historical process as an uninterrupted continuous process. Okay? There are interruptions or points of break and points of break implying that we are th there we are no longer talking about the simple question of transition. Okay? We are talking about the break, the end of something and beginning of something completely new which you cannot find in the other, okay, in the earlier forms. For instance, this idea of discontinuity would have a great impact in Foucauldian thinking later on. Okay. Uh, yeah, we began to destroy the notion, Marxist notion of history, as you can see. We introduced the idea of break into the question. Now I'm going to introduce another, this time seemingly special, but having temporal effects as well. Okay? Now, Marx was talking about, you know, uh, that's the most familiar one for you could be uh, the differentiation of society into certain instances or if you like, levels. Okay? And the primary levels he was talking about super and infrastructures. Infra by infrastructure simply meaning the economic organization of production, okay? While with regard to the superstructures, uh, what we roughly understand today, I don't know actually what should we understand by the term, but uh, by culture, okay? <coughs> so Althusser, uh, by making references to Karl Marx's texts, later texts, I mean, Grundrisse, Kapitel, etc., actually uh, succeed in uh, establishing a sort of purification of the social levels, actually, which were, which comes closer to the Talcott Parsonian differentiation of the social whole. I guess you all may remember, simply because this was something to memorize. Uh, uh, Talcott Parsons' differentiation of social functions. Okay. You have seen Talcott Parsons, right? In our courses. No, it was called a job. No. From bottom to top. You know, this A stands for adaptation. And within Marxist framework corresponds to economic relations of production. It's going to be something like this. Hmm? Is there anybody who remembers it correctly? Okay, this? No, that. That was right. That was right. G stands for goal attainment. Roughly corresponding to politics or what Althusser would call political level. Economical, economic level, political level. This stands for, I stands for integration, corresponding to what Althusser would call social level. And L stands for latency, corresponding to what Althusser would call theological ideological level. Sometimes he calls it theoretical, sometimes theological. Okay, let's write theoretical.
Now, the argument is about actually the status of Marxist conception of mode of production. Okay? You know, this concept is a very important concept, is Marxist thinking. What Althusser does here differently from the others was this. Okay, after presenting these two, it would be much more easier for me. Uh, he says that this notion is an abstract concept developed for theoretical purposes. Okay, so you can, when you go out there and look in a particular society, you would never find this, any particular mode of production, in its pure form as it has been described by theory. So what you would find in real, actual situations is not modes of production, but rather what Marx himself calls and Althusser borrows, social formations. You are going to be surprised how this relates with the problem of history. Okay, French social formation, Turkish social formation in 21st century, so on and so forth. Okay, now when we are talking about social formations, we are talking about real, actually existing societies which may display different characteristics pertaining to different modes of production. Yeah. For instance, a peasantry, for instance, considered as a remnant of the feudal mode of production can be found in Turkish social formation, which is predominantly characterized by capitalist mode of production. Okay? So, in Turkish society, for instance, we can say that capitalist relations of productions, production predominates, but there still are some elements belonging, remaining from the earlier modes of production, okay? Say peasantry, say whatever you like, okay? Landlord, for instance. Tribes, for instance, in Turkey, etc. okay? Now, this forces Althusser to think about actual social formations as a mixture of different modes of production. What is the implication of this? Okay, return back to this. Okay, a social production uh, formation, sorry, is consisted of these three, four levels. Sometimes Althusser adds other levels. As I said, he was not consistent, okay? Sometimes he, he talks about three levels, sometimes five levels, sometimes with different names, etc. But what's important is not what the instances or levels of a social formation are, okay? What's important is their relative relationship with each other, okay? So, for instance, the social level, uh, the relationship between social level and economic level, or the relationship between the latency or theoretical ideological level, sometimes he calls this as theoretical legal level as well, okay? So, uh, laws of the country or society belongs to that level as well, okay? So, what was interesting was this, okay? For that to happen, for a social formation to include, which was already a problem in Marx, his own thinking, okay? To include the remnants of the other social formations, earlier social formations, okay? It means that Actually, these levels should display a certain degree of autonomy. This was quite a serious theoretical problem in Marxism itself, for Marx himself, simply because, yeah, we are talking about the super and infrastructure, but how are we going to determine their relationship? Marx was said that the superstructure is dependent upon the infrastructure. In other words, okay, Man's ways of thinking is the function of their organization of production. Okay? Or if you like, their economic life or their practices of production. Okay? Whatever. Now, this statement had been <coughs> understood by many Marxists 
as if uh, there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between the infra and superstructure. If, for instance, uh, mode of production at the economic level infrastructure was capitalist, then the expectancy was that every superstructure, every component of the superstructure in that society should correspond to capitalist relations of production. Okay. But there was an empirical problem here. Okay. There was an empirical problem and the empirical problem was simply this. When you conduct an actual empirical research on this, how for instance the legal structure interacts with the economic structure of a given country, you are going to find out many elements in the legal structure that may not consider it to be the product of the uh, economic relations. Okay? Or in a similar way. Okay? For instance, when you take the culture of a country, if you follow word by word Marx did said about it, your expectancy will be that the whole culture in a given society should be product of the economic relations. If they were capitalist, the culture of that society would also can be characterized like as capitalist. Okay. But the problem was that it was not easy to do, to do so, to characterize each and every cultural item or any element in superstructure, what's called superstructure, as the product of the capitalist relations of production, for instance. Okay? So Althusser's response to this problem was to actually name it, nothing else. Okay? The problem was there for long years, and Althusser solves this problem by declaring the relative autonomy of the instances. Okay? Relative autonomy instances means that these instances may belong to different, or components of these instances may belong to different modes of production, belonging to different periods of history. Okay? Well, one logical conclusion of this, however, that each and every instance in a given social formation is expected to have a particular autonomous history of its own. Okay? Which means that in the integrated unity of a social formation, it turns out to be possible to talk about multiple histories. Okay? Forget about talking about a history which is expected to be valid for all of the mankind. Okay? Now we are in the position of tracing these different histories or these different historical paces rate of change. You know? So if for instance the economic relations changing are changing in a rapid pace, in a rapid way, okay, you can easily say that, say uh, the, the elements of, at the social level for instance are not expected to change with this pace. Okay? Actually, this brings about the spatial disintegration of what we call the social whole as social formation. Okay? This means that a social formation can no longer be constituted or thought about as an homogeneous integrated unity. Okay? If I a little bit push this argument further, I would arrive at the conclusion that Actually, later on has been declared, society is impossible. Okay? Simply because what we have here in the form of an apparent form of a unity is rather a disintegrated and scattered bunch of relations. Okay? Whose components even do not follow the same historical pace and even do not aiming at the same historical ends. Okay? Now you can see how such a simple analysis turns out to be destructive for our integrated conceptualization of history. Okay? On the one hand, we disintegrate the spatial totality of society, but on the other hand, by introducing the idea of the possibility of different historical paces, pertaining to each social instance, okay, we are at the same time 
scattering that, that whole which we call society or social formation in it is uh, temporal unity as well which means that while certain of the components of a given social formation directing this way in their historical transformation other components may aim at different directions okay even though he insists that this autonomy should be conceived as only as a relative autonomy with his insistence on the determination of the economic level in the that famous phrase in the last instance okay. so it was only in this last instance of importance of the economic level a social formation can hold it is totality. Okay? Let's celebrate.